Yeah. So if you look at the uh, the history of uh, age related macro degeneration (AMD), um, this is one of the first things I did uh, um, because obviously, it, if uh, you know, if this disease is driven by processed foods, then when we didn't have any processed foods or they were extremely low, AMD should have been rare. And indeed, that's what I found. And this literally took months of research. Um, but but I ultimately determined that um, there were no more than about 50 cases of macular degeneration in all the world's literature between 1851, when, when, when the retina was first visible because of invention of the ophthalmoscope, and 1930, 1920 or 30. In, in that roughly 80-year period, there were no more than 50 cases of AMD in the, all the world's literature. And most all of those came in the 20th century. There was just a handful of cases literally in the 19th century. And the ophthalmologists were describing that there was immense evidence that they were looking at the retina and they had photographs and images and drawings and all that. But they weren't, there weren't any images of macro degeneration in the 19th century at all. What do you think is the best evidence that we have that vegetable arrows are, are driving this? Yeah. Okay. So the best evidence, and you know, we um, so we have a paper that's uh, that's slated to be published, I hope, um, and uh, another paper. And in this paper, we've taken um, data from um, twenty nations, and we plotted that versus seed oil, average seed oil consumption for a period of 25 or more years. So if we didn't have 25 or more years data, we weren't plotting those two together. And this is in the book. Um, but, but anyway, and then, and then we analyzed that data to look at you know, the correlation and using the R Pearson correlation coefficient, the, the, the number is 0.78. So that's a very high correlation between vegetable oil consumption and macro degeneration. Now, you know, then we, if we get into the nitty gritty detail, that's extremely complicated. Um, but I can talk about some of that if, if you want to. Get, get nitty gritty. I think we got to get scientific. Like, yeah, maybe just before we get into that, just tell people what macular degeneration is. You mentioned the retina, the back of the eye, but a lot of people don't even know what the macula is. And it's something that I didn't know before I went to medical school either. Right. Okay, so the macula is the, is the central retina. It accounts for about our central 10 degrees of vision. And just as it, the, the name AMD implies, this is a degenerative disorder. And what we see in macular degeneration is many things, but we see mainly we see um, loss of retinal pigment epithelial cells. And these are the cells that support the photoreceptors. The photoreceptors are the rods and cones. And that's what ultimately is required is to see. So, so we have, you know, we have loss of the RPE of the retinal pigment epithelial cells. Each one of those cells supports about 30 photoreceptors. Neither of these are regenerative. All right. So if you lose them, they're gone forever. I think of it like having a stroke or having a heart attack. You know, once those neurons or once those muscle cells are gone, you know, they're, they're gone. They're replaced by a scar. You know, they're gone forever. So you have that, you have this damage to the retinal pigment, ep retinal pigment epithelium, you have thickening of Brooks membrane, which separates the blood supply, um, the choriocapillaris. So the separator between that choriocapillaris and the retinal pigment epithelium is the Brooks membrane. And Brooks membrane thickens and calcifies in a way that is analogous to exactly what we see in an atherosclerotic plaque, or they're very, very similar. And I'm not the only one that's making this comparison. This was made by others, not me. Um, so, you, so you have that going on. And so this creates a barrier. Well, this is the barrier where, there, where you know, there's nutrient exchange between choriocapillaris, the vascular supply, and the retina proper, right? So you have, you have that going on. And then you have all these other many, many other factors. Like all the, vi the fat-soluble vitamins are involved. So if you have deficiencies of vitamins A, D, K2, all of those are either drivers or hypothesized to be drivers. We're the only ones that have hypothesized that K2 is an issue because Brooks membrane actually, as I mentioned, it calcifies much like you get calcification in coronary arteries with heart disease. You get calcification in Brooks membrane 
as the, 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 the disease progresses. But, but ultimately, what people need to know is that, you know, this, th these mechanisms all come together um, in, in a unified way to produce damage to the retinal pigment epithelium that then atrophies or dies, these cells die, and we lose those, and that's geographic AMD or atrophic AMD, and that's the dry form of the disease. And then Brooks membrane can actually crack and break, and vessels can grow up through Brooks membrane underneath the retina, bleed, and this is wet AMD. And this is where you have this disastrous loss of vision. But either way, you can end up blind. And, you know, so we go back to that data. I mentioned that there is, you know, no more than 50 cases of AMD in all the world's literature between 1851 and 1930. Well, by 2020, 196 million people were affected with AMD. And by 2040, it's expected to be 288 million. And by 2006, 14 million people, the World Health Organization has shown, were either, you know, had severe vision loss or blindness bilaterally. So in other words, these are people that are, for the better part, blind, uh, either bilaterally blind or bilaterally severely vision impaired. 14 million people, that's an, that's an extraordinary number when you think about, well, we didn't have any more than 50 cases of AMD for a period in history of 80 years, right? So all this connects together. And now it's not just vegetable oils, but it's all the processed foods together, just like all these other chronic diseases in my view. Yeah, I want to show this graph from your book. This is the graph showing the correlation between the incidence or the prevalence of age-related macular degeneration on the y-axis and the, um, the average polyunsaturated oil consumption in grams per day on the x-axis. And um, again, the Pearson correlation coefficient is 0.78, which is a pretty strong correlation. And the outliers tend to be, I would say, above the, the line of best fit, Chris, rather than below the line of best fit. And why I'm pointing that out is because um, the, it, there are countries where uh, there is increased uh, prevalence of age-related macular degeneration, um, but there are very few countries where there is less, I would say, there, there are more countries where there's more age-related macular degeneration than you would expect, rather than countries where there's less age-related macular degeneration for any given amount of polyunsaturated fat consumption. So that's a very compelling correlation. And there are other correlations. I've spoken about other studies. We can, I'll put a couple of studies on the screen on YouTube for people here that I'll get after the podcast. There are other studies looking at this correlation and showing very strong correlations in more specifically studied populations in the United States. Um, so this correlation between seed oil consumption and macular degeneration is very strong and is compelling. It, it certainly begs the, it's, it's a very strong hypothesis. Now, these are all correlations. There's no, there's no data. No one's ever done a study where they gave people seed oils and looked for macular degeneration. This would be a very difficult study to do. But I think there are some compelling mechanisms that you discuss in the books. And uh, in the book, and I was wondering if you could talk about carboxymethylpyrrole um, or carboxyethylpyrrole, excuse me, uh, because this is really interesting. This is one of these breakdown products of linoleic acid. This is, so there's linoleic acid, which I'll just explain for people, is an 18-carbon omega-6 polyunsaturated fatty acid. When we say polyunsaturated fatty acid, that's a mouthful. We'll often abbreviate that PUFA or P-U-F-A. And of those PUFAs, the one we think about the most is linoleic acid. So when we're looking at the percent of linoleic acid, not to be confused with linolenic acid, or more specifically alpha linolenic acid, which is an omega-3. We're talking about omega-6 linoleic acid. We are looking at the percentages of that fatty acid in the oils of certain seeds. And we'll talk about different seed oils and how much linoleic acid they have later in the podcast. But this linoleic acid is a very unstable fatty acid. That's not really debated. That's an organic chemist's proof. You know, you can prove that with organic chemistry, that the more double bonds a molecule has, the more unsaturated a fat molecule is. And when there are more double bonds and the molecule is more unsaturated, then you have more instability at the level of electrons attacking these double bonds, kind of organic chemistry complexities. And so these, this linoleic acid can break down into products, and we call these oxlams or oxidative products of linoleic acid metabolism. I've spoken about 4-HNE on a previous podcast with Tucker Goodrich and Jeff Knobs. 
But I'd never heard of this carboxyethylpyrrole until I read your book. So what is CPE? It's one of these breakdown products. And why is it so interesting, Chris? Yeah, so uh, really there's, um, now I call these um, advanced lipid oxidation end products, these products that come from linoleic acid that are, are initially, um, you know, converted to e even physiologically or in the body or pathophysiologically, we might say, in the body, they're, they're, the linoleic acid reacts with um, radicals like hydroxyl radicals, for example, um, and it's, and it, and the, the first product of that is lipid hydroperoxides, which are very, un, they're very unstable and they break down quickly. So they don't really cause damage, but they break down into these advanced lipid oxidation end products or ALs, I call them. And these are, these are chemicals like 4-HNE that you just mentioned, um, malondialdehyde or MDA, carboxyethyl, carboxyethyl pyrrole, acrolene. Um, and then you have the, the, what I call the oxalams, 9 and 13 HODE. Um, that's hydroxyoxide, decadienoic acid. But anyway, and then there's literally hundreds of others, Paul's and that, Paul. And that's the reason I wanted to point this out is that I, I compare this to like cigarette smoking. You know, when you smoke, you know, you, when tobacco is burned, you create more than 6,000 chemicals. And when you consume vegetable oils, you ultimately have breakdown products that, that you end up with hundreds of chemicals. So these few that we're naming, these are just the ones that we know that are associated with a lot of damage, and they certainly are. But with regard to carboxyethyl pyrrole and um, macrity generation, first of all, I, I don't know that this is a major player, Paul, but it is a player, like I said, and there's many, many, many arrows all coming together, you know, with, with regard to macrity generation. But with carboxyethyl pyrrole, we actually know that um, this molecule is creating autoimmunity in some people. And so, so this breakdown product, um, carboxyethyl pyrrole, then can cause um, SEP, we've shortened that to SEP, SEP-related antibodies. And so those antibodies then can cross-react with um, antigens in the retina. And this may be part of macro degeneration. So there it is. That's in it in a nutshell. 